brought your notes today because we're going to do a little bit different kind of sermon. And it's going to be very encouraging, very, I feel, uh, wow, goodness, that should stop now, right? Okay. I think it's going to really equip you. I'll explain. So many of you guys are familiar with the Vietnam War, right? Everybody remembers the Vietnam War? And what surrounded the details of that war wasn't pleasant. If you remember, at that time, Russia, they finished World War II, and Russia was kind of expanding its grip for communism, and they're moving into the countries along those damaged European border. And so at some point, they actually moved into Vietnam to spread communism, and America said, ah, that's as far as we want you to go. So we started sending soldiers in. Problem is, not all of America was really for it. And they started doing what? You remember they, they kind of pushed the draft? So they started drafting people, American citizens, to go there. Now some people weren't really up for it. They weren't really interested in fighting a war that they weren't familiar with, they weren't concerned about, and they really didn't have a desire to go there. And so you created a real animosity between the government and the idea of this war across the world for the people they've never met, not really losing sleep about, because the government said, hey, that's a problem, you know, several thousand miles away. People weren't happy with it. And you can imagine the way this draft worked is the government, you know, would require you to register this, uh, the service after 18 years old, and they would pull so many, they'd send you a letter, maybe they'd give you a phone call, and they'd grab you. And in response to that, what happened? People began to leave town, or hide, and they would call them, what, draft doctors. And so that concept kind of rung true as I began to write this sermon because even if you were not part of the draft, that was in your mind. You knew that there was a war going on. Even if you didn't care for Vietnam, even if you didn't want to be in the war, there was a draft and there were people fighting and they were calling people to join that war against their will. You can imagine, you know, if you have a family of kids and they're about to turn 18, what would have been on your mind? That the government may have asked them to join the war and maybe they wouldn't come home. And so that was the mindset for the people at that time. And it was very frustrating for people saying, I don't want to be a part of this war. And so people just did what they could to avoid it. Now, why do I say all that? Because whether you know it or not, right now, even outside those doors, there's a war. There's a war right now. You can say, well, Michael, what do you mean war? Like ISIS? Or what's going on? Like gas prices? Or maybe a line for McDonald's? What war are you talking about? See, the issue, my friends, is this. The Bible tells us before you were born, there was a great conflict occurring between good and bad. If you want to say God, Jesus and the angels, against another God who would fall, we know him as Lucifer, who said, I don't want anything to do with your righteousness and your holiness. God pulled himself, got kicked out of heaven. They referred to him as Satan, or the devil. And he took angels with him, called demons, if you want to call it that. And they began to entangle themselves in a war. And even though people don't want to be a part of that war, people are saying, I don't really want to deal with that kind of war. I don't want anything to do with it. There's a draft happening right now. And I'm sorry that many of you have already been drafted, whether you know it or not. You see the contents. Mm -hmm. So there's a draft, and it's already happened, and your names have been pulled. You say, well, how did, I, how did I get involved with a war that I don't know anything about? I don't see it. You know, for the people in Vietnam, that was on the other side of the world. How, what do I have to do with a war like that? You're saying there's a war going on between God and somebody else. Why can't, what do I have to do with that? See, my friends, when you chose Jesus, when you chose to serve God, you, you raise a flag, whether you know or not. That flag said, I serve Jesus. And you took sides. You immediately took a side. You chose Jesus was good. But you became part of that war. You become an enemy to somebody, an ally to another person. And so whether you know it or not, you've been drafted. Let me show you a verse to make sense of this. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says this. This is Paul's letter to Timothy. He says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Verse 3, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, 
that he may please him who enlisted him as what? As a soldier. So two words stick out to me. It talks about warfare, and it talks about enlistment as a soldier. Enlisted as a soldier in warfare. And so, whether you know it or not, across this nation, across the world, when people hear spiritual war, they say, well, that's, that's the minister, right? That's the minister's job. Or that's an evangelist that goes off to other countries, and he's teaching other people the Bible. He may deal with something. And so we picture spiritual warfare as something that's like this happened to church. And so what happens? People don't get equipped. And when they don't get equipped, and the war starts, and they call your name, what happens? People get hurt. So, what do you mean people get hurt? What is spiritual war? Now, spiritual war may be a normal term for some of you, or maybe all of you, but spiritual war is a funny thing. If I were to ask you to describe what does spiritual war look like, I would love to hear it, because it doesn't really say in the Bible. I don't know if you've read a verse that says they shoot each other with guns, or do they take a knife, a throat, or a sword. It does not really describe what spiritual war is. But let me tell you very boldly, the effects of spiritual war is very real. If you were looking at any world war, in the return you would find destroyed cities, casualties, families that are lost, children abandoned, starvation. You would believe me. I mean, governments are falling apart. So it isn't a surprise that when you have a spiritual war and it begins to show itself in life, you have tragedy, you have sudden death, you have financial loss, maybe a job, like all of a sudden you're falsely accused, you're told to get out. That's a painful thing. Because, oh, a job, is that really spiritual? I'll tell you what, you lose your job, you're hurting. All these things matter. And people say, can that happen to me? If you're not aware of it, sure it can. Because we pretend like there's not a war going on. But when tragedy strikes, people say, I never saw that coming. I never saw that coming. See, the thing is, guys, we've all been drafted. And I, me, as a minister, my job, even as Paul said to Timothy, I want to teach you understanding the depths of war. Now, we've talked about spiritual war before, but tonight, I'm going to add some things to your arsenal. See, I'm not telling each of you that you're going to be losing your fight. Like, you were joined a war like Vietnam that never ends. I'm going to encourage each of you that when it comes to spiritual war, you come into it confidently. You already have the victory. Now, how? How does a believer have victory in warfare? And that's what I want to show you tonight. Let me go to one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 10. Verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. It says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Y'all see that? What is Paul saying? He starts like this. He says, though we walk in the flesh. Now, let me explain what he means, though we walk in the flesh. What does spiritual war really involve? It can involve the devil. It can involve this world, believe it or not. It can also involve what we call the flesh. Why do I say the flesh? Because when you got born again, when you got saved, you're still kind of stuck for who you were. Even though the image of God is recreating the spirit inside of you, we still have our old tendencies, right? And so the Bible says there is a war against ourselves, against the world, meaning the lust of the world, and then the devil. So what does Paul say here when it comes to warfare, just to get us rolling? He says, even though I'm still a human, even though I may, I may make mistakes, even though my name used to be Saul the murderer, I don't war like that. See, the devil, the first thing he'll do with you is try to get you to war with your flesh. You make a huge mistake, the devil starts saying, hey, fight about that mistake. You get an argument with a friend or a family member, battle it out with a family member, even though it was the devil causing that. Have an argument with your wife, that has nothing to do with your wife, but what happens? You all start fighting. So Paul says, look, we don't war according to the flesh. We don't adjust, we don't react to things based on what we see. But what does he say? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, which means like fleshly, but they are mighty in God. So what Paul says is when it comes to warfare, I'm extremely mighty. I have great strength. I can do things that I otherwise could not do in fighting a war that I cannot see. Now, how many guys want to be better at spiritual warfare? Just me? Okay, a lot of people. Good. Because by the end of tonight, 
You're going to have three weapons that are going to be very mean to the enemy. I promise you. Extremely mean. I've been trying them out. They're working very well. So I want to show it to you. So I hope you can write some. I'm going to pull this off in a minute. This can be loud. Okay. By the end of tonight, you're going to see the way that God can move through you and battling the enemy. So it doesn't have to be such an uphill battle. Because sometimes we as Christians feel like warfare is just oh, back and forth. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to find the devil. It was not meant to that way. It wasn't meant to be that way. It was meant to be you're in a tank and he's got a stick. That's how I see spiritual warfare. And if you're not seeing it that way, then I ask you to pay attention very carefully. And so what I've titled this sermon tonight is 3D training. 3D training. Why? I'm going to give you three Ds. By the end of the service, you'll understand all three and how to use them to shoot people down. I mean the spirit, of course, the powers of darkness, and how to get rid of them. So the first D tonight, the first D is declaration. Declare or declaration. You can use it as declare or declaration. Declaration. You can say, Michael, that's a weapon? Absolutely it is. What does declare mean normally? In, in our English language, when we say to declare, we mean we want to say something, right? We want to explain something to somebody. Hey, you declare a message or you have the Declaration of Independence. You're just talking. And that's good. Okay, we talk, we declare something to them. And sometimes it's used in court cases where you declare evidence or a tax file. Or when you go to the airport, you declare what you bought from another nation. But in the context of the spirit, it has a much different design and a much different meaning. And it has far greater impact than you can imagine. The context is this here. You can take notes and I want to make it as easy as I can for you. A declaration in the spirit is to take something unknown to mankind and bring it to life from God. I'll say it one more time so you get it. So what God does with the Bible, when you hear a declaration, is this. God takes an invisible attribute of the Spirit, or of God, or of truth, and makes it manifest by a declaration. That's the definition. I'll make it easy. Let's go to Psalm 19.1. And you'll see this. Don't worry, we're going to go slow, because each of you need to be equipped before you leave to understand how this works. Psalm 19.1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Let me slow down. We're not going to skim through this. The glory of God, is that something you can touch? Maybe, but probably not. Can you describe the fullness of God's glory as a man? But it says that heavens declare God's glory. So what is God saying? God is He visible? Maybe, maybe not. He's a spirit. You can't, I mean, you can look for him, but you may not find him. He's everywhere. So something says that God is invisible by design. So how does he bring something invisible, but yet glorious, to life? He declares it. How? The heavens. Y'all see that? We're going to hammer this. I'll give you several analogies before we make it a weapon. But I want you to have a book-like knowledge of what declaration means. Let me just rewind for a minute. God says, I have glory that is very hard to quantify. It's hard to imagine. So I declare it by showing you what? The skies. You guys ever seen a pretty sky? You ever seen the red kind of pass through the clouds? I just stop and say, I'm going to see cars doing that some days. But I'll be like, wow, that's neat. In the morning, the sun kind of breaks the sky. And God says, that's kind of a picture of how amazing I am. He says, I declare it to you. I declare something invisible, and I can bring it to light by the heavens. Okay? So let's go a lot deeper. I think that's a good start, but let's go deeper. You guys are familiar with the Old Testament, New Testament. Believe it or not, there's prophets in the New Testament and there's prophets in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament prophets had a much different ministry than what you see in prophetic today. Why? In the Old Testament, the, Old, the Holy Spirit was not yet poured out on everybody. It was poured out when? Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit got poured out. So in the Old Testament, believe it or not, the whole people did not all have the Holy Spirit. But some people did. And of all that group, we have what? We have the prophets. So what does that mean? These prophets had the Spirit of God in them, and when they spoke, they were speaking the Bible. And when you look at the major prophets, we're going to look at it here in a minute, you're going to see how God used a prophet to bring to light something that was invisible. And don't worry, I'm going to show you how this works. Go to Isaiah 21, verse 6. Isaiah 21, verse 6. It says this, God tells him, For thus has said the Lord to me, Go set a watchman, 
let him declare what he sees. Now, he's not talking about the natural, guys. He's not talking natural. What this prophet is saying is, I have a vision or a dream of something, and God is saying, when you have something in the Spirit, if you'll open your mouth, you can make it manifest by declaring it. Y'all follow that? We're going to hammer again. Another verse. Isaiah 42, verse 9. says this, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. What is he saying? He's saying something that you've never heard, once I speak it, you'll hear it. You see that? So a declaration is God using a man, and typically in this case an Old Testament prophet, to bring to light something that was what? Unknown, and it becomes a new thing. One more verse from Isaiah. 48.6. This should make it really clear. Isaiah 48.6. You have heard, see all this, and will you not declare it? I made you hear new things from this time, even hidden things, and you did not know them. So what am I building here? A minister, especially you guys, are trained for 3D training, for warfare. You must understand that God can show you something that you've never heard of and never seen, but to make it known, to make it manifest, to make it seen in your life, you have to what? You have to declare. Now you say, well, that's Isaiah. All the prophets were dealing with this. I'll just read a few. Jeremiah 42, verse 4. The next major prophet. Jeremiah 42, verse 4. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard, indeed, I will pray to the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall be that whatever the Lord answers you, I will declare it to you, I will keep nothing back. Now there's a story behind this. There was a group of people trying to run from Babylon, and they asked Jeremiah to pray. And so what Jeremiah says is God will reveal a secret, something you don't know, a God answer, a hidden thing of the Spirit, and what I hear, I will reveal it to you. Y'all see this? Y'all see it? Yeah, that's declaration. Declaration is to bring forth something of an invisible realm into our realm so that people of natural can follow. Now, if you want to skip ahead from this, if you want to take notes, just write down Ezekiel 40, verse 4. Every prophet in the Old Testament had to declare something that God told them. But for time's sake, I'm going to skip ahead to Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. Just, that was Ezekiel 40, verse 4, for notes. Daniel 2, verse 27. It says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, please put the verse up, the secret which the king has demanded that wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. Background of this story, guys. You've got to know the Bible. Follow along. Daniel 2 says, A king named Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He wouldn't tell anybody the dream, but he said, Tell me the dream, and I'll believe the interpretation. Y'all remember the story? So Daniel said, your people cannot declare that kind of information. Only who can? God. Now, listen, before we get to us, you must understand the context of declaration. You'll hear this word used in songs, in worship, in churches, but it's a powerful weapon when you see the revelation of what it is. So what Daniel says is, what God holds as secret, what belongs to God, you can declare but people that are not of God cannot. A demon cannot declare the truth of God. Demons can mock God. They can pretend to reverse, I'm sorry, to refer to God's word, but they cannot declare it. Daniel says, your people cannot do what God does. I can, because I am a man with God's spirit. So you see that. So any prophet, you study carefully, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, or Ezekiel, they could declare something that God had said secretly, and it made known. Now, let me tell you very boldly, guys. When that prophet spoke, was it important? That was history, right? The Old Testament, what you're reading, are those guys' lives. When you read the Old Testament prophets, that was their story. And what they spoke became the word of God. That meant what they declared had a lot of power. Let me make it clear. You guys might be asking, well, what does this have to do with me? Why does declaration have anything to do with me? How does it become a weapon? Again, to reiterate. A declaration means I pull something from the God's realm and I bring it to life in my life or your life. Now go with me to John 16, 12 through 15. In John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. This is Jesus talking. 
He's talking to the disciples. He had taught them everything he knew within reason because we're just people and we cannot understand God in one city. So Jesus says this in verse 12. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Y'all catch it. Listen very carefully. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things the Father has are mine. Therefore, Jesus repeats himself, take notes. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to who? You. Y'all see that? So let's back up for a minute. I'm telling you, this is a very profound weapon that the enemy will do anything he can to shut you down. Why? You go back to the Old Testament prophets. When they spoke, things would happen. And they said Israel is about to be destroyed. Guess what? It was the end of Israel. They said, Nineveh, you have about three days. Oh, you're going to die. They had about three days. You see that? What they were doing is speaking what God had told them. And it happened. That's why God needed Jonah to go to Nineveh. Did you ever wonder that? You really think he needed a man to go to Nineveh? Why was it so critical? Because once that man opened his mouth over that nation, it's sealed. What do you have in you? The Spirit of God. What was speaking in Jonah? What spoke in every prophet that when they spoke, it was called the Word of God? Because the Spirit was declaring something. And when it was brought from the spiritual, it became physical. And what God speaks is going to happen. And what Jesus was telling the disciples and telling you is, you can't understand everything I said to you. It's too much to understand. But the Spirit of God which will live in you, He will make known something to you. He will declare the voice of God to you. And when you hear the gods speaking, and you begin to speak out, it becomes reality. So you can hear about kingdom, you can hear about dominion, you can hear about healing, you can hear about divine protection, you can hear all this stuff. But you must recognize how it works, otherwise it's just book knowledge. And I don't need a bunch of students. I want people that minister in God's power and His Spirit. And if you don't understand how to do that, and you want to know how it works, you must understand that God reveals something and you declare it. I'm going to show you how to put it in practice. But I'm going to move on to the next one. It's all going to glue together. Three Ds, right? Three D training. But do you see the importance of that? Jesus said, I can tell you something you've never heard. And you'll declare it, it becomes reality. Is that fair? A lot of the prophets did this. Let's go on to the second D. It's called decree. Decree. First D, declare. Second D, decree. What is a de uh, decree? Whereas a declaration can be heard, a decree is written. And I'll tell you what, what's written has a lot of weight. You know that. When you want to be very formal with somebody, do you not write? You call it a contract. Maybe you get a ticket. If a cop just tells you you got a ticket and you drive home, you're probably laughing because like, there's no proof. But if you have a written ticket, you got a problem. So what is a decree in the, in the language of today, when we have a decree, it's a letter. It's kind of a law or a rule. But if you look in the spirit and you look at the Bible, decrees only came from one kind of person, typically. Kings. A place of authority. When a place of authority, a majesty, a king, some kind of lead, a governor, did something, he would create a decree. And that would go out to the nations. And let me tell you something. When it went out, it was going to happen. You see the context? Yeah. Go to Ezra chapter 5, verse 13, and I'll explain. David, Solomon. Solomon builds a temple, right? His son kind of drops the ball. You have the split between Israel and Judah. And then Israel, what happens? They begin to fall away from God. And the nation, Assyria, takes them captive. Judah has years of revival, but ultimately, Babylon takes them captive. Sends them off. Years after that, God raises up the Medes and Persians. And a king named Cyrus arises. Cyrus, by the Spirit of God, says what? I want you to rebuild the temple. What temple? Solomon's temple. Is everybody okay? If you haven't read that far, it's alright. Ezra 5.13 However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, that's because he beat the Babylonians, King Cyrus issued a decree to build this house of God. That means Cyrus had a letter written and went out. 
Now, building a house of God, is that like a small task? No. It took them years to build the original temple. But Cyrus said, one letter is all I need to make a monumental task done. I mean, I'll see that. So if a person of authority writes one letter, the task, regardless of its magnitude, is still done. Is that not true? Regardless of the need, regardless of the resources and provision or time, as far as the king's concerned, I wrote a letter that should be done. And everything else will come with it. Now, if you're going along with me, a minute ago you saw... Declaration is a very powerful truth from an Old Testament prophet perspective, but I hope you're seeing that's you. So go with me, and we're going to understand how this decree works. Look at Ezra 6.3. He gives you more detail. Ezra 6.3. In the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. So he's very specific. He means Solomon's temple. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations of it be fir firmly laid. It's height 60 cubits, and it's width 60 cubits. A cubit's about a foot and a half. So it's big. Okay, it's big. What I'm telling you is, this decree went into detail. But I want you to remember this. A decree comes from a person of authority. And so what you want to understand is, how does a decree work? Where does it come from? And what does it mean to me? So we saw a man's decree. Who is the highest authority in this world? Uh, king of kings, right? We have a king, and he can write a decree to have an entire temple built. Then the king of kings must make decrees. Go to Psalm 148, verses 1 through 6. It's a little different tonight, I know, but I want you to have these things firm in your mind. Verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him from the height in the heights. Verse 2. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. Praise Him, you heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. Take note. Verse 6. He also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Now, I don't want to sound mean, but before you were born, the sky was there. The stars were there, the sun was there, the moon was there, the clouds were there. After you die, most likely, the sun's going to be there, the moon, the clouds, the stars, everything. What God says is, I decreed something, and it's not going to change. The sun doesn't adjust to your clock. We adjust our clock to the sun. You had a long day, you're going to see the stars at night. There's no getting around it, guys. What God is trying to teach you from this psalm is, if God decrees... For thousands and thousands of years, it's just not going to change. Now, if you want to be smart with me, you say, well, Revelations is over. That's fine. God has a button. He can turn it off too many once. But I'll tell you again, when God, the King of Kings, decrees something, whether you want to believe in science and thermodynamics, the law of diminishing return, whatever you want, the sun hasn't changed. It's still like clockwork. Thousands of years later, why? God decreed so you have a declaration where God brings a truth from the invisible and speaks it through a man, and it becomes automatic, God can also write. He says, I want this to be done. Simple as that. Simple as that. It's written. It's done. You guys know the word messianic prophecy? Messianic prophecy? That's not a mop cleaning job. I'm not telling you you have a spill in your bathroom. Go with me to Psalm 2, verses 7 through 8. I want to dig in deeper. I want you to really know what it is to be fully three-dimensionally trained. Psalm 2, verses 7 and 8. The psalm, they assume typically is written by David. By the way, David's also considered a prophet. He says, I will declare the decree. Now hold on. I will declare the decree. Now if you read this last week, you might have thought that's just a sentence. I hope now you understand this is very different. He's not saying something casually. He's declaring something that God has written. What is it? The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. I put verse 7 on the screen. I want you to understand this. This is talking about God and Jesus, both of whom are not physically real just yet. They're in the spirit. They're, they're existing. They're God. But Jesus is not yet born. As a matter of fact, this would be hundreds of years before Jesus is born. 
And he said, I will declare something that nobody in this entire universe has ever heard, and I will decree it so that it cannot change. Do you know what Hebrews says Jesus is the same yesterday? Come on. Today and forever. What's that yesterday part? It was decreed. Today I have begun. You see that? I will declare. I will breathe a truth that this world cannot be ready for, and I will decree it so it can never change. Jesus is the same. Y'all see that? He said, you are my son. You are my son. It cannot change, and I will tell this world you are my son. Jesus is already the son of God, whether they declare or not. The declaration makes you aware of it. Us. See that? So if you have a power of declaration, you have a power of decree. He said, well, what's our turn? Do you see the term of de declaration? That was John, right? He said, I will give you my spirit. I will, it will speak to you. Now let's get to us about decree. Read to me Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. So let me tell you something, guys. When it comes to decrees, do you have a Bible? I hope you do. It's got a lot of decrees. When it talks about you, you know that's written for you? It's permanent. You know this world can do everything it wants to destroy the Bible, but it cannot? You can burn a Bible, you're not turning the Word of God around. You can make up fake Bibles, you're not stopping the Word of God. Do you follow? The Word of God cannot change. And so when you have a legit Bible, the Word of God, it's not changing. It's decreed on you. Now I'll read Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. That's a lot to say. Did you catch it? He said, Blessed be God who blesses us with what? Every spiritual blessing. That was decreed over you. That was written. Can it change? Let me give you a hint. Go back to the law of the Dar Darius. You remember Darius through Daniel in prison? The decree? He said he decreed it. What did the people say? Can a decree be altered? No. What happens if you try to do, uh, alter the decree? It said, let a timber from his house be stood and let him hang from it. You didn't mess with decrees back then in the time of the kings. If you tried to change a decree, and when they saw Darius said, nobody can change it, throw him in prison, I don't want to. I'm sorry, the lion's den. He, he didn't want to, but it could be changed. Now tell me, can you change his blessing? No. Why isn't it working? You need to understand decree. You need to understand God's word cannot change. And it has power because it cannot change. When a president pardons you, does he need permission from the world? Nope. If the president wants to pardon you, you're free. I don't care what people think. You can decree when they're pardoned, that's it. They're gone. That's it, they're gone. What does Jesus say about us? He says this. He says he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before when? The foundation of the world. Isn't that crazy? This God, our God, the God, seems to have a lot of foresight. And he wants us to understand just how much he loves us and just how much he's invested himself in us. So much that he describes in a letter, before you even knew me, before you even existed, before your parents existed, I chose you. That's an amazing decree. Can you imagine what it would look like in heaven to see a letter, all gold, saying, hey, I chose you. Your name's right there. There's a certificate. I, I picked you out from a crowd. I wanted you. I wanted to know you. I wanted you here in heaven with me. That's what a decree looks like. But it's in the Spirit. See, we, we look for these things. And, well, where is God? How is God working with me? Why does He want to move my life? You need to go back to what God's given you and work out of that. Use that as a standing point. Listen, i got one more D. And I want to make it to a point where I want to show you how all these things grow together. We have, what was the first one, guys? Declare. 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 Second is? Degree. Degree. So the third one, for every offense, has God be a good? Defense. defense. The third D, defense. See, we're talking war, right? We're talking war. And when I talk about defense, people think of what? Like huddling up and holding against the wall, and you start to get punched, and you're like, okay, let me block that. Or you think of defense on a football game. The enemy's got the ball, and they're trying to score against you and your family, and you're trying to hold the enemy back. 
I don't mean defense like that, guys. That's not defense. That's not the way God sees defense. Let me show you defense the way God does defense. Acts 23, we're going to go there in a minute. You know the man named Paul. He was Saul formerly. He murdered a lot of people, became Paul. Towards the end of the book of Acts, he went back to Jerusalem because he was pleading with them to accept Jesus. And a riot broke out. You remember that story? And they went to go murder him. And the governor at that time grabbed him and saved him. Remember, he pulled him from a crowd before they murdered him. Now let's read Acts 23, 23 through 27. Now this is the governor talking. The governor says this. He said, he called for two centurions, saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to send Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. Let's stop there for a minute. You know, when Paul was being secured by this guy, you know what happened? A group of Jews said, we'll take a vow to do what? To kill him. And what did they vow with? They said, we won't eat or drink until he's dead. That became known to the governor. Let's read it one more time. Acts 23. Having heard this murder charge against Paul, a minister of God, and he called for two centurions, saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. He wrote a letter in the following manner, Claudius Lysias, that's himself, to the most excellent governor, Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, and having learned that he was a Roman. Let me get this straight. This guy was trying to serve God and he was being attacked by a mob who was trying to kill him. And then later this mob said, we vow to murder you. So you can't go into spiritual war under the threat of the devil. You have to know you're protected. Now what does this protection look like? 200 soldiers, 70 spearmen, 200, oh, sorry, 70 uh, horsemen, 70 spearmen, 200 spearmen. And not just that, Paul doesn't have to walk. I don't know if you know this in that time, but having a horse probably meant you're, you're made it somewhere. You get to walk, you're probably lower, if you have a horse to mount on, that means you're somebody. And this guy says, you are Paul, you're a Roman, you will not be attacked again. You really think 40 guys are going to take over this army? Remember the 40 guys that said, we're going to kill you, otherwise we're not going to eat? When you saw that army, you probably thought, oh, that was a dumb vow. Think about it. He says, why? Because Paul is a Roman. Who are we? This Roman was a citizen of a nation that had a dominant army. Is not our nation, is not our spiritual citizenship greater than any citizenship combined? You tell me, when you talk about spiritual warfare, saying, oh, I don't know if it's going to work. And you see how God protects you. See, this just gives you a picture of the defense you have. Again, you're not a boxing match putting your fist down. You're walking directly at the enemy with about 400 people behind you or in front of you. Do you need to put your arms up now? Do you need to cover? Do you need to go, I need to take some rest? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. When I talk about defense in a realm of 3D training, I am saying you have more defense than you can believe. And you do not have to put your shield up. You have your sword, but you're surrounded by something. You all see that? And not just that, you only have to walk back. You're going to ride back over there. Some of you have probably taken a beating before. Maybe I just me. Maybe I've taken a beating in the spiritual war. But I didn't know what I know now. And when I understand how much God loves me and protects me, I don't fight alone. I don't. And so what usually was happening a long time ago, or maybe they got a hit on my face or something like that in the spirit, this time they can't touch me. Why? I've got hundreds of people guarding me in the spirit. Don't see that? So when you talk about 3D training, is it fair for the devil? No, it shouldn't be. We should be terribly unfair against it. It should be all in our hearts. It should be all in our hearts. There should not even be a chance. When Paul was surrounded by the 40, they didn't have a chance against him. Nope. It never says again about those 40 people. You never hear about them again. It's pretty safe to assume they probably don't. They cannot stand up against his army. That's how a child of God should fight. We should understand our defense. So you might go, I want to use all this. I want to use that declaration. I want to use that decree. And I want that kind of defense. Where do I get it? See, I've been talking about Old Testament prophets. I've been talking about the king. I've been talking about governors. What about us? Write your notes if you're paying attention closely. 
Divine protection. Divine protection. Go with me to John chapter 10, verse 27 through 30. Jesus is speaking. And he's going to tell you something that is beyond most people's understanding, even though it's easy to read. John 10, 27 through 30. says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them, snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now what's going on here, guys? We've heard three things. A declaration, a decree, and defense. Let me tell you the declaration. Is that my Father protects me. Jesus says an invisible truth which is now made manifest to you. No one can touch you because somebody invisible guards you and no one can take you out of his hand. Can you see the hand guarding me right now? Can you? No, let's be honest, you can't. Do you see a hand guarding you? No. But Jesus declared it over me and said, a hand guards me that you cannot snatch me out of. That's the declaration. What's the decree? It says as Jesus writes, it says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. That's a decree over me. Divine protection, guys. It's written in my life that I cannot be killed. I cannot perish. I can only go home to heaven. When God says, hey, Michael, it's time to go home, I go home. You don't see that. Jesus gives you an invisible truth. Nothing can take you from your Father's hand. Then Jesus decrees and says, I give you eternal life. What's the defense? Jesus says this. He says in the end again, no one is able to smash them out of my Father's hand because I and my Father are one. That's the 3D defense. That's the kind of training you need to go into spiritual war. That you can understand that whatever you are, demon, whatever you are, sickness, whatever will it name your God, you can have some long name or a short name, I don't care. You cannot touch me. You just can't touch me. That's divine protection. Why? Because Jesus declared that my Father, who I cannot see, stands with me, and he holds me with his hand. And Jesus decrees and says, I give you eternal life, you shall never perish. And the defense, Jesus and my Father are one. I'm surrounded. I've got a vanguard. Front and behind, side and side, I'm surrounded by the ever-presence of God who walks this whole world. Tell me if you can leave the presence of God. I can go to my store, presence of God. I can go to the car, presence of God. I can be driving an accident, it can come in front of me. The presence of God is there. I can be in my job. There can be an emergency in the chemical plant. It can't hurt me. You all see that. That's the kind of training God wants to give you. So when Paul told Timothy, you be a good soldier and go to war for Christ and commit these things to faithful men, that's what he's saying. I see that. I see that. See, they had this training. They would have been taught these things. And we come to church and we come to church and we listen. Well, okay, that sounds good. Let's sing. And you come home, but you don't understand. Yeah, you're in a war without the gun. I don't want you guys to go to fights without a gun. You should be so equipped. You have a magnet shield around. You just can't. It just bounces off. It just goes away from you. That's the kind of operation we need. So this is the plan, guys. I'm asking you to commit these verses, this understanding, right in here. Because if you attempt to say, okay, oh I understood him, I'm asking you again, as I do it every second, please, take a minute, take the notes. If you have a question, hey, what was that? You write down the three functions. Study it. Pray over it. Say, God, hey, I want that to work. I need that right now. I don't want it tomorrow. I don't want it maybe as a birthday gift three years from now. I don't want to get it from a lay of hands meeting and maybe one guy gets it, the other guy doesn't. You know how frustrating that is? You see some guy get blessed with something? You all get the blessing. You all can get this understanding. Is that fair? I have one thing to remind you of. I'm going to read from Isaiah 53 as we close this out. Verse 7 and 8. Would you stand with me? Isaiah 53, 7 and 8 says this. It says, Jesus was talking about himself. He says, he, I'm not sorry, not Jesus was talking about this verse about him. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. 
of the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. The Lord's Supper, which you just talk, took, was a picture right there. Jesus did not talk back when they hung him. He could have. When they beat him, it said he didn't really defend himself. When Pontius Pilate accused him of all these stuff, he just sat there, just stared at him. He was quiet. He was led quietly to his death. And they hung him, and he died. And he rose again. But what this verse says is, all that happened, but there's one question in there. Did y'all see it? Did you catch the question? Who will declare this generation? See, those guys were looking with their eyes. They thought everything was the same. We killed a man, we threw him in the tomb, cut the stone off. But at that moment, everything changed visibly. You see that? A people that never knew Jesus standing in front of me was made alive. All of you was made alive at that moment. Whether you know or not. Do you see that? Who will declare his generation? Who will say, I'm alive for Jesus? I was once lost. I was once blind. But now I see. Now I'm saved. They follow that. They thought they were just killing a man. But who will declare the work Jesus just did? You follow that? Do you see the call? It's an evangelism call. You have to tell people about Jesus because he was silent and he's died silently. He's saying, well, who's going to open their mouth? Who will bring to light all this stuff? You. What Jesus said is, it's your turn. It's your turn. I did my job. You took communion? It's your turn. He did his part. You just took his body. You had no business, but he said, I'll do it for you anyways. Now it's 